Well, we need to pray for that whole situation, especially for those who are left behind, and both Americans and... Yeah, I'm fine. I'm okay. Thank you. All right, uh, let's prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option, <clears throat> excuse me, of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins, which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are our rock, you are our stability, you are our salvation, you are everything to us, and this is the way it should be. And we recognize because of the Holy Spirit and your word and connecting these together that we can have joy no matter what's going on in this life. We're so thankful that we don't have to be chained to the circumstances of our life and that our life is essentially based on whether good things or bad things are happening because our relationship is with you and that never changes in the sense that you continue to love us, provide for us, protect us. We pray in these dark times that you will encourage us and help us to focus on your word because that lifts us out of the depression and, and discouragement and all the woes that we face today. We take one day at a time, and each day we want to stand for righteousness. We want to be used by you to be a light shining in a dark place. And we, we can't do that if we're afraid, so banish any even speck of fear in our lives unless it is fear towards you and respect. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate on the message this evening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> Last uh, Tuesday, this past Tuesday, we had a very short lesson of what I had. In fact, it's one verse because we did a lot of review. <clears throat> so I'll put this on the board for you. This is where we ended, and this lesson goes from this page right here down to here, and here's tonight's lesson. But what we spent most of the time on was reviewing what came even before this. So we kind of landed on Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. And it's because we were looking at, let me get up here where we were, uh, Romans chapter 4, verse 14. And what, where we went to, it went to in Galatians chapter 3 is very similar to what we have in Romans 4, 14. In fact, when Paul taught Galatians, it's, kind of a mirror image in some parts of uh, Romans. Romans and Galatians are essentially very close to each other. And I'm going to start out by night, uh, tonight by <coughs> excuse me, focusing on what you see up here now. This was in not last, well, we did cover this Tuesday. And what, I, what you see in red is what I'm trying to help us to focus on. Faith is made void and the promise is nullified. So there are things in God's plan that if, if most of this is about works versus uh, faith and merit versus grace. And so we, <clears throat> excuse me, I use these verses here to go to James chapter 2 verse 24 that says that for it's not just by faith alone, but uh, works have to be added to your faith, or else your faith is dead. And that is, nearly everybody that goes there puts that in a positional context that means as pertaining to uh, eternal life, which it is not. But when we go now with this, 
you see, these are, these are things that nullify something else. And that's where we're going to start tonight. Let me get down here to where we are. And that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, this is lesson uh, 115. And we start with Galatians chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. And this has to do with the Jews who were rebelling against this idea of being justified by grace because they thought, okay, well, that's fine what happened to Abraham. God made a promise to him. But much later on in time, actually 430 years, the law came and the law annulled all these other things that came before. And Paul wrote Romans and Galatians in this particular, in these verses, to demonstrate that is an abominable statement. It is not true. So in, you, if you turn to, in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, that's where we'll pick it up tonight. It's amazing how much Abraham is, and what we see in Genesis, is quoted in the New Testament. Now, the first thing you might notice, I put it in red up here on the notes, that verse 16 starts with a parenthesis. I put it in red so you could see it. So this is parenthetical until we get to the end of verse 17, and then that's going to close the parenthesis. Now, when something is in parentheses, it's an added thought, but it interrupts the flow of what's going on, but sometimes you want to insert something and you want to do it in the middle of a, trying to show something else and you put that in parentheses. That's what parentheses means. So we'll start here. It says, now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Now you see I have capital J, capital C. That's just short, of course, for Jesus Christ. This is referring to the seed of Abraham is also referring to the seed of the woman that we saw in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And then he makes a note here that is really a grammatical note. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed. I thought that's interesting. That's, he's talking about grammar here and how important grammar is. And so he says, he does not say and to seeds, plural. The word seed there in the Greek is sperma, and it is singular. But rather to one, and that's referring to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this. The Mosaic law, even though the Mosaic isn't there, I added it because that's what's in context what it's talking about. The Mosaic Law, which came 430 years later, later than what happened with uh, Abraham, does not invalidate, and that word invalidate means to make void, a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. And there you'll see the end of that parenthesis. So he's very clearly saying that the Mosaic Law <clears throat> did not change. It could not change a covenant, which is a promise, <clears throat> excuse me, a promise that was previously ratified. Now, previously ratified, that Greek word is a participle, and it's a perfect passive participle. So what that means is the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was ratified in a point in time, perfect tense, and the results of that ratification goes on and on and on until infinity. <clears throat> it's a passive voice, which means they received this covenant. So, a law that came 430 years later does not make void or 
invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. Now, nullify is an infinitive. Usually when you see a word like to, the next word following often in the Greek is what's called an infinitive. And this is an aorist active infinitive, which means as to nullify it in aorist tense in a point of time. And the active voice means to act upon it and to nullify the promise. And then you close the parentheses. And the promise is salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ. The Jews at that time were working for their salvation. They were very legalistic. And they didn't like the idea that one could be saved just by believing in the Messiah, the coming Messiah. They didn't know him as Jesus Christ then, but they knew the promise of the Messiah. And they knew from Abraham that Justification is by faith. The imputation of God's own righteousness to a person is by faith. It didn't have anything to do with works. So you can imagine for all these people who were working hard to be saved, they didn't like this, and they were contending with Paul trying to make their case. <coughs> Excuse me. So that ends that parenthesis. Now we'll go on to some extractions I've made from this. On, this is Lesson 116 for tonight. Notice the similarity between Romans 4.14 and Galatians 3.17. Notice the words that are used, how similar they are. So Romans chapter 4.14 says, if those who are of the law, and that means to keep the law to be saved, are heirs, that means heirs of Abraham. And if you are heir of Abraham, it's talking about a spiritual heir, you would have to be a believer. So if those who are of the law, that are trying to keep uh, be saved by their works, are heirs of Abraham, faith is made void. You cannot have works and be an heir of Abraham without destroying faith. And the promise is nullified. God's promise to Abraham would be nullified in the faith that he says is how we are justified before God. If the law came in there and could do that, then the faith and the promises are gone. They, you can't have both. Now that was Romans 4.14. Now look at Romans, oh, excuse me, Galatians 3.17. The law here is referring to the Mosaic law again. Does not invalidate, and that means make void, a covenant previously ratified so as to nullify the promise. And the promise again would be salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see the parallel there? Both of them are on the same page as far as what they're dealing with and what they're saying. And I've already previously made the point that works and faith are mutually exclusive. Now I have some points. Y'all ready to get some points? Based on what I just gave you here and what we've been learning so far, I came to make about some points. I think I have 11 points. The first one is this. These verses point out the fact that the law and grace are mutually exclusive, meaning that if something is of the law, it cannot be of grace. And if it's something is of grace, then it cannot be of the law. It can be one or the other. It cannot be both. You're either depending on works to be saved or you are work, or you are depending on grace to be saved by faith. But you cannot have both. Point number two. The people that would subscribe to the idea that you, it's okay, I mean, you need to believe in Jesus, but you have to add works to it. 
they don't know that the law and grace cannot coexist. It's impossible. They bought the lie. I think the biggest lie that ever came from the pit of hell is to make people think that it's okay to believe in Jesus Christ, but you have to add works to it, as if it's a kind of a little insurance policy to go along. Because if, if the faith alone doesn't make it, then the works will kind of cover over for it. And that is a hellish lie. And it means that what I just said, if I said that the law and grace cannot coexist. So if you add something to faith, then the works cancel out the faith, which I'll get into here in a moment. Point number three. Good works have merit, so when good works are added to faith, which has no merit, then faith is nullified, which puts one under the law, which can only judge a person, not save them. That's what happens when someone adds faith to their belief in Christ. What it does is take them out of the realm of grace into the realm of the law. See, that's what you do when you're doing good works. You're doing, uh, you are abiding by the law, supposedly. And when you do that, then faith is nullified, and you are automatically then under the law, and the law cannot save you, it can only judge you. So what I'm saying is, for all those millions of people out there that say, well, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, and when you're talking to them and you're going to give them the gospel or just find out where they are, and you say, well, great, brother, I'll see you in heaven. You have miserably failed because they very well and more probably than not have added to faith in Christ works. And that means that the grace is obliterated and now you're under the law. And the law can do nothing but condemn you. Point number four. The human exercise of faith is simply being convinced that God's promises are true and you're trusting in them. That's, uh, that's all faith is. Another way to put it is faith is helplessness reaching out in total dependence upon God. There's no merit in it. All the merit goes to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God for what happened on the cross. You see, what people would say if you say that you don't need works, in fact, you, works have nothing whatsoever to do with being saved, a lot of people would gasp at that. <gasps> what do you mean? That's sacrilege. No. Because faith is is not meritorious. It's a simple system of perception. That's it. Faith is helplessness reaching out in total dependence upon God. The human exercise of faith is simply being convinced that God's promises are true and trusting in them. That's it. There's no merit in that. Point number five. It is so sad that so many people think they are saved because they say they believe in Jesus Christ but also believe in keeping the law good works to be saved. You can nearly expect that when you're out and about around people, maybe you're in a concert or you're at a, some kind of get-together outside or inside, wherever it may be, and you start talking to people, and you want to give them the gospel, and you say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? How many times have you asked people that and they say no? I know it happens, but how often? In this country, in the 
places that we go, most people would say, oh yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean that they're not depending on works as well. In fact, most people believe that you have to have works in order to be accepted by God. That's what religion is. Religion is a system of works in order to be acceptable to whatever God you're worshiping or you think exists. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a unique, a unique relationship with God that has nothing to do with earning your place before Him. Every other religion will have a system of works in order to be accepted by God. You know how many Christians profess to be Christians and are still working to get to heaven? You know how many? We all know most, of, most people you talk to are you saved? I don't know. Well, what do you, why should you be able to go to heaven? Oh, well, I go to church. I've been baptized. I'm a good person. That person is as, as lost as Hitler. And people will say, oh, no, yes. There are a lot of well-meaning people. And you would look on the outside and they do all these good things and you think, well, if anybody's in heaven, they are. Well, anybody would say that doesn't understand grace. And they don't understand the damage that is done when you say you believe in Jesus Christ, Christ and add anything to it. It cancels out the grace. And it's no longer a gift. God only gives salvation as a gift. And when you try to do something for it, you're saying, no, I don't want your grace. I'm going to do something myself for it. No humility. Point number six. Jesus Christ said, it is finished on the cross. That means that nothing can be added to salvation because it is given as a gift which is received by faith alone. Tetelestai. Some pronounce it tetelestai. It is finished. It's completed. It's the last thing he said. It is finished. What is the it? His mission was completed. He was successful in removing the barrier between God and man, which the main one was sin. God poured out on him the sins of the entire world. He says it's finished. You can't add anything to it. You can't take anything away from it. Point number seven. Depending on just one good work nullifies grace and puts one under the law which condemns a person. See, if you say, well, I have to do one thing. I, let's say the one thing I have to do is I have to be baptized. I have to be dunked in water. When you do that, you don't receive it as a gift. Now you have participated in it. Now you have done something to add to it as if God needs your little tidbit of being dunked in water. Do, you, do these people really think that Jesus Christ left the glory of heaven and came to earth in the form of a creature lower than the angels that he created? and was on the earth 30, 33 years, something like that, and then went through the horrors of the cross, the torture, and then received the imputation of the sins of the world on himself when he was screaming on the cross. Do you think that he would do all that and say, well, not, that's, that's what it takes. However, you have to be dunked in water or else none of that counts. Does that make sense? I bet sometimes somebody's going to see this and they're a big, big uh, <laughs> baptism. Uh, they put a big, a big, uh, they think baptism is so important. Most of the time, the people who 
are really into baptism, very dogmatic about it, know nothing about it. I had a lady here probably 25 years ago, and she said, oh, that was such a great message, and I just love the church. I just have one question for you. I said, what's that? She said, where's your baptismal pit? Uh, baptismal pit, yes. I said, well, what kind of baptism are you talking about, a ritual or a real baptism? And she said, what? I said, well, you know, there's seven baptisms, don't you? And it, that's what prompted me to write the, the booklet in there, What About Baptism? And I don't, you know, baptism is a very controversial subject, mainly because people are so dogmatic about it and know nothing about it. But my point is, if you just add one work, just one, if you depend on one thing, and I think a lot of people who say that they don't believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, deep down think it really has a part to play. Because if you ask them, are you saved? And they say, oh yes, I'm baptized. Well, why would they say that? I'll press on. Point number eight. Adding works to faith demonstrate that one believes Jesus Christ failed on the cross to atone for the sins of the world because our own good works must be added. Either he atoned for all the works, uh, all the sins of the world, and he completed that, he was successful, and he said it is finished, or else he didn't. And for those who think they have to add something to it, have to believe that he failed on the cross. Because now you have to do your part. Point number nine. Then it would also mean that he did not tell the truth when he said it is finished in John 19 verse 30. He said it's finished. You said, no, it's not finished. i got to do my part. And they don't know how much work it takes, what kind of works it takes. Is it really all that good news if you have to maintain your salvation by doing good works? And not even knowing, did I do enough good works? What kind of good works does it take? And if I sin a little more than I normally do, does that take away from the good works? A hundred questions come up about this that are not even relevant because it's simply not true. That's why you don't find any of these answers to the questions I just asked in the Bible because they're not even relevant. They're not there. Surely if God did say that, well, you, you, you do have to have some good works added, well, people will say, okay, well, how many? What kind? Why well, would we do? There's nothing there. Not one word answering those questions because it's balderdash. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Point number 10, adding works to salvation invalidates the following. And I have some verses here. Adding works to salvation invalidates the following. We start with Abraham in Genesis 15, 6. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord and he reckoned it, reckoned it to him as righteousness. But where's the works? If a person believes that you have to have works, then why did Abraham receive the righteousness of God through faith, period? Romans chapter 3, verse 28. This is a killer. For we maintain that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And people who are working to be saved, they cannot believe that verse. They can't accept it and still believe that you have to have works. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith. You're either justified before God or you are not. And the only way to be justified is by faith in Jesus Christ, period. And I'm giving you verses. This is just a very small sampling. I could go on pages and pages and pages of verses that demonstrate that 
works can only condemn you. It can't save you. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. This is a monster verse here. Let me get rid of this top part here and maybe we can see better. Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Notice I have that in red. Look how many times it's there. In one verse. A man is not justified by the works of the law, but, but through faith in Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, if you quote that to someone or you show it to them as a verse and you ask them, you, you say that you have to have works to be saved. That means to be justified. Can you explain this verse to me? That's not being done, I don't believe, by most Christians. And this is a powerhouse verse. Why isn't it used? And then ask them. You're saying one thing, this verse is saying three times the opposite. Can you explain that? We need to use these verses. It's the power of God. Yes. Oh, that's just one of many. The thief on the cross, yeah. Well, he wasn't baptized, you know, and Jesus Christ said, you'll be with me in paradise, yeah. I mean, there's so much ammunition in the Bible. And some people are afraid to go out and try to give the gospel to people. And the, the most people out there do not have a thimble full of knowledge. And we should have great knowledge. But we, and listen, we don't want to do it condescendingly. We don't want to do it in order to win an argument. We're doing it for them to see what the Bible actually says because I think this is the biggest issue in the world and always has been as far as salvation is concerned. It's what the, the, the very thing that Satan uses to get people to think, well, yeah, if you're going to go to heaven, you have to be really good. You, you know. and, and again, this is just a few of the sampling. Here's Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. Galatians 3, 24 through 26. Therefore, the law has become our tutor. What is a tutor? Someone that helps support you in, in learning something to train you. Therefore, the law has become a tutor, a trainer to lead us to Christ. Well, how does it do that? It does it by showing you that you cannot be good enough or do enough good works in order to be saved. Works doesn't have anything to do with it. In other words, you're guilty of the law. No one can consistently obey the law. However, even if you committed one sin, you're guilty of the whole, whole law, so no one can say that I'm, I can keep the law. You can't. You have to keep it not only consistently, but perfectly. And so by that, people can know, uh-oh, I, I I need something. Other, I, I can't keep the can't keep the law. I need somebody. I need something, and it points to Christ. That's how it tutors people that way. So therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. This is you go from the in the Old Testament, the law, and when it transitioned in the dispensation of the church, now we're of grace. And that's when he said, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. We're not under Mosaic law. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Point 11. By the way, I could have, I could have put 20 or 30 more verses like this, but I think it's enough to get the point. Verse 11. Being justified by the law would nullify the covenant God made with Abraham because it was made on the basis of grace, not on the basis of the law. 
stark contrast. Being justified by the law, if we were justified by the law, it would nullify the covenant God made with Abraham. Because you have the law or you have the grace, and they are opposites. They cannot coexist. Being justified by the law would nullify the covenant God made with Abraham because it, the law, was made on, uh, excuse me, uh, God made with Abraham. That covenant was made on the basis of grace, and there is no grace in the law. So it's not made on the basis of the law. The only thing that can do is condemn you. Now, way up here where we started with Galatians 3.17, you see that? I added all these points, and now we're going to hit Galatians 18, which was follows that other one, but I just wanted to throw those other in there. Galatians 3.18 says, For if the inheritance is based on the Mosaic law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So most of the time when someone inherits something, they inherit it from whom? Their family, right? So when it says if, if the inheritance is based on the law, now you know that this is not so. It can't be. So he's making a, 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 a something that he knows is not true. For if the inheritance is based on the law. Now that's another of those, of those ifs. Remember I told you last time that you would say that has to be a second class conditional clause, which means if and it's not true. But this is if and it's true, but it's a debater's if. From the perspective of, let's say, a straw man, this would be true. You're, you're taking something that they would believe and say, if that is true, and it would be in this debate, you use it for a debater's technique. It really means if it's not true, but we're going to pretend that it is. If it's based on the Mosaic Law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it. By the way, that granted is a perfect middle indicative. You all know by now when you have a perfect tense, it's something that happened in the past and the results go on and on and on. Middle voice means that God was affected by his own action here in a good way. And the indicative mood means it's reality, it's not just a potential. But God has granted it in the past and it goes on and on, has granted it to Abraham. What is the it? It's the promise. By means of a promise. He, well, he's, he's talking about salvation here. Faith is the way that we are justified before God. Now I have a quote here that has to do with verse 18. Do we need to take a little break? Are y'all still with me? I don't want to be going too fast or anything. Y'all good? Okay. Here's the quote. The Mosaic Law was not an addition to the unconditional promise to Abraham, which was that salvation was by faith in Christ. And that's what some of the Jews were saying. Well, yeah, that was back in Abraham's time, but now we got the law. We got the Mosaic Law. And that cancels out that contract and, and all that promises business. Now we have a new thing. And this is what Paul is saying in Galatians and in Romans, that that's not so. So again, the Mosaic Law was not an addition to the unconstitutional, Excuse me, I'm so used to saying unconstitutional. <laughs> oh, wow. Mosaic law was not in addition to the unconditional promise to Abraham, which was salvation was by faith in Christ. In Paul's day, a contract was binding. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? Even if you have an ironclad contract these days, the old saying is, there never was a contract that couldn't be broken. And, well, I'll, I'll press on, but I think y'all get the point. 
Even unbelievers kept their word. So how much stronger was the promise from the Almighty God? Would he do less? And in this context, Paul is saying the Mosaic law was not about salvation. Did you hear that? The Mosaic law never was about salvation. It was a tutor to point people in the right direction as to what salvation was about. And in context, Paul is saying the Mosaic law was not about salvation. It did not add or detract from God's unconditional promise to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant. And that covenant goes on and on forever. Faith in Christ will result in salvation, always was and always will be. The second point is by adding anything, legalism, to faith, one is saying God wants to add to the contract. Now, in the contract, what if you made a contract with somebody and you both signed it and you both had a copy, and then a little time passed and the guy was doing something that was contrary to the contract, wouldn't you? You would. Ask, well, what are you doing? This is not in the contract. Oh well, I changed it. You what? That's shocking, isn't it? A man knows better than that. If when you make a contract, it's got to be in that contract, in the paperwork, or else it doesn't matter. Even man knows that. So if God is going to make a contract, do you think that he is going to any way make changes to the contract? No way. So second point is adding anything like legalism, good works, to faith. One is saying God wants to add to the contract. This Concept is blasphemy. Principle. Inheritance is never from the law. Inheritance can only come through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. I know that people say only a fool would not make a contract with people and have it in writing. But the contract doesn't really seal anything. It's the integrity of the people who enter that contract. It's a promise. The promise is what is going to either make or break a contract, whether it's in writing or not. If both parties have integrity, then it will be a good contract. If either one does not have, in, in, uh, have integrity, then it doesn't matter how many lawyers you have or how much you work to try to make that contract work. It will not. And that's why promises are so important. And when God makes a promise, then there is no doubt about it. Verse 15. Are y'all still all right? Okay, just won't take your... Temperature every once in a while. Verse 15. This is Romans chapter 4, verse 15. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. First of all, why does the... It says the law brings about wrath. How does the law bring about wrath? Anybody know? Right, because people break it. The, the, the law can only condemn. When you are obeying the law, all is well, right? But when you do not obey the law, there is no grace. Now, I know sometimes you can talk somebody out of a ticket. And sometimes these officers have... Uh, a bit of discretion. I think that's a good thing. I think they ought to have that. But in a courtroom, there is no such thing as grace. Is there? In, in a courtroom, there's no such thing as forgiveness. Is there? You. Because it's not designed to have grace. It's not designed to forgive. It is designed 
to condemn those who break the law. And for people to try to be saved by keeping the law when they know they cannot is insanity. And see, whenever you keep the law, not only are you nullifying grace and you're nullifying the faith, you're nullifying Jesus Christ as well and what he did on the cross. So people who say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I still think you have to do all these things, are not saved. They did not receive it as a gift, and that's the only way you can receive it. You add anything to it, and you have rejected it. Okay, the law brings about wrath. The law cannot save. It can only condemn as a consequence of disobedience. The law chastises all of us because we all are incapable of keeping it consistently. As hard as you want to try. And there's some people out there that are nerdy about obeying the law. They don't know that a law has to be constitutional. It has to be moral before it is, it is even valid. They don't know anything about that. They just know, I want to be good and I'm going to obey every little dot and tittle. They can't do it. Nobody can. Here is a quote from the pulpit commentary. It says the following. The law simply declares what is right and requires conformity to it. It does not give either power to obey or atonement for not obeying. Hence, in itself, it worketh not righteousness but wrath. For man becomes fully liable to wrath when he comes to know, through the law, the difference between right and wrong. Does mankind have to have the law to know what is right and wrong? No. Why is that? We have a conscience, don't we? The Gentiles were doing what God would require. They didn't have the law. But they had a conscience. And the law was given to the Israelites, to the Jews, for their betterment. They were in bondage for 430 years. And so how did they know about developing or creating a nation? Nothing. And the laws give flesh on the bones of a nation. If you ever go into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and look at the law, you tell every little bitty specific thing in detail was given to them. But that's not all it does. It wasn't given to them to condemn them, even though that's what the law does. It gave them instructions on health, instructions on how to worship, how to defend yourself. All these are th great things. But the Jews took it and made obeying the law, the requirement in order to be in the kingdom. And it turned out to be a monstrous legalistic system that choked the life out of everyone. That's what happens. Because they thought it was all about works. Here's the other part of the verse. Let's look at the verse again. This is Romans 4.15. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. What is that talking about? Where it is, here it is right here. Where the law is, where, excuse me, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. A person may be, may still be sinning in his action, but if there is no command prohibiting it, then he has not violated the law. They could still be sinning, but if there's no law against it, how could it be violating the law? It can't. And I've been telling you about how in our system of government, no one can go directly to the people and order them to do anything. They had to go through a process. They had to go through the Senate and the House Make a bill, send it to the president, and he has to sign it. Then it is a law. But just to go to someone and 
it, it, a governor makes a dictate and expects everybody to obey it is the same as not having a law, because that's not a law. And it's unconstitutional. And those who are those tin pot dictators should be, they're the criminals, let me put it that way. They have violated their oath to the Constitution to protect the rights of the people, and they do heinous crimes, and yet they're not held accountable by the people, yet God will hold them accountable. Romans chapter 5, 13 says this, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Now, we haven't got to chapter 5 yet, but we'll get there. Now, the next verse here is Romans 4, 16, which we will not tackle tonight. We do not have enough time. But I hope I have impressed upon you how dogmatic we should be when someone tries to sell us a bill of goods saying, well, you have to do good works. And they go to James 2.24 and say, well, see, work, uh, faith is fine, but you have to add works to faith. And you take it out of context and try to make it salvific, meaning that you have to have good works in order to be saved. And not one in a hundred believers even know that that doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Every time that you see the word salvation, it's soteria in the Greek, and it's the same word for what happens at the point of salvation, phase one. It's the same word that you use in phase two, but they are completely different. And you have to see the context, and you'll be able to make the difference. Do we have any questions before we close? I can't believe it. <laughs> okay, let's close. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word, and we can be so dogmatic based on your promises, based on what you have declared to us in your word. We will be eternally grateful, as we are now, that we don't have to earn or deserve salvation. In fact, we couldn't earn or deserve it in a million years. We were fallen creatures. We are born fallen, spiritually dead. It's because of your grace that we even have the opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then receive the gift of eternal life, the gift of justification, the gift of imputed righteousness and many, many more that are irrevocable. What a God. We pray that you will impress upon us this truth that we know and how desperate people need to hear that truth. For most people we come in contact with believe that they have to do something meritorious in order to be accepted by God. That the, the harvest is ripe. Help us to engage them in a conversation. Explain to them the truth and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.